Hello and welcome back to the Minecraft series. Uh, I've been working a bit on the storage system. There's the farm again from last time. So let's go have a look. Yeah, as you can see, I uh, I built this place a bit close. Now, it actually worked out pretty much perfectly. One more block this way and that would have been quite annoying for here. So it's funny how things kind of work out that way. And that's kind of what I want to talk about today, at least when it comes to the real world and real life, how things work out. Now, here's the thing. Things don't just work out. It all comes down, at the end of the day, to the sovereignty of God. And that's really what I want to talk about, is his sovereignty. God's sovereignty, I think, is something that it's always, in a way, involved in our thinking. And yet it's very rarely something we actually think about. So, for example, if something, you know, if you've got something planned or there's something going on in your life or you're maybe worried about it and you say, oh, I'll just trust God to do it. You're not really thinking of the sovereignty of God in that moment. You're thinking about, you know, what's God going to do, which is very much involved with his sovereignty, if you get me. So it's, you know, trusting in God's plan. God's got it worked out, this, that and the other. But there's no real consideration of his sovereignty of how he's had it all worked out from the beginning and so on we still like to think about ourselves as having this sort of libertarian free will where yes god's got a plan and god's going to work it all out but it's still up to us and we still have to do everything ourselves and so on and so forth now i do agree we do still have to do things we can't just say god is sovereign therefore i'll do nothing what we just say is god is sovereign therefore i will do something and trust that if it's God's will, you know, I'll be able to do it. And if it's not God's will, I won't be able to do it. But God's sovereignty should be something that causes us to go into action, not inaction. Um, and also the tree farm here, what I'm doing is because when these trees grow side by side, I get much less leaves and therefore much less saplings. So now whenever one prop um, comes up, I chop it down. I think God's sovereignty is something as well that, you know, while it's at the heart of that idea of I'm going to, you know, let go and let God, if you will. At the same time, the same sort of people who say that sort of thing are also not people who are likely to be big fans of God's sovereignty in a lot of different areas. For example, they wouldn't be a massive fan of God's sovereignty in election. They wouldn't be a massive fan of God's sovereignty in salvation and choosing the elect and so on. They don't want to think of God's sovereignty over them because they, in a sense, want to have that free will. They want to make the choices that they make, not just in terms of salvation. You know, it's my, I chose to follow God, I made the decision, so on and so forth. But in other aspects of life as well, whenever they do something, they want it to feel like it's their own achievement, their own accomplishment. And I got this done as well, all around here, putting the logs in here. They want to feel like they've done something, so they don't want to give the honor and glory to God because they want it to feel like it's their own special accomplishment that they've done. And so what you get is a bunch of people who talk about God's plan and letting God do his thing and so on and so forth. But then they don't have that same energy when it comes to things that they want to take credit for. So their own salvation being something that um, really does come down to God and only God but that they don't want to give God the credit for because they want to have that credit themselves. They want to say, I made the choice. And it's not all because of this kind of selfish, I want to say, I made the choice thing. It's also because in the area of salvation, God's sovereignty is something that makes us uncomfortable. Now, I think it's something that should make us comfortable, but it's something that makes us uncomfortable because if God is sovereign in election, which he is, and if not everybody is elect, which they're not, and that means God chose not to elect everybody. And that's something that people just don't like. They don't like that idea that, you know, because we live in this modern culture of, oh, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. They don't like this idea that maybe God would pass some people over, a lot of people over. Maybe God isn't going to choose to save everybody. They hate that idea. They absolutely hate it. Now, I, I don't, I, I do agree. God does not... Um, desire the death of the wicked as I believe it says in Ezekiel God is not happy at people being damned I agree there but I also believe in God's sovereignty over salvation and it's true that not everybody goes to heaven and that makes it true 
that God does not sovereignly elect everybody. And again, people trying to take God's sovereignty away from him and kind of put some onto themselves and say, it's all about free will. So they say, yes, it's God who chooses, but he chooses based on us and based on our free will. So that way they can kind of have it half and half. They can kind of have God be half sovereign um, and he can be sovereign over the good bits, the bits that they like. And then they can say, well, all the bits that we don't like, it's everybody else's fault. It's not God's fault. So when it comes to salvation, it's like, yeah, God sovereignly chooses to save those who have faith, which, you know, yeah, we like that. That's happy. That's nice. And so on and so forth. But then when it comes to those who don't have faith, it's because, oh, well, they chose to reject God. And what that does is it makes a complete mockery of the idea of God's. Um, I hope I've, I've just I've, I've actually forgotten the word. Sovereignty. I don't know why I, 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 I'm literally talking about it the whole video so far and I've somehow forgotten the word sovereignty. Sorry. Um, but it makes a mockery out of God's sovereignty, I believe. Uh, I think that if God isn't fully sovereign, then God's not sovereign. Simple as that. And I don't think God is embarrassed by the things that he sovereignly chooses to do. But a lot of the time we are. A lot of the time we look at the, you know God sovereignly doing something and we don't like it and we get embarrassed on his behalf, but he's not embarrassed of anything he's ever done. There's nothing God looks back on and thinks, oh, I shouldn't have done that, I should have done this differently, that differently, or whatever. That doesn't happen. God sovereignly chooses to do what he does and he gets it right every single time. And he is truly and purely sovereign. And if he's not sovereign, that has massive implications, massive negative implications on our lives. Sometimes people will ask, well, if God is sovereign, why pray? And my response is, if he's not sovereign, why bother? If God's not sovereign, there's really nothing he can do. If he's bound by something such as free will or what have you, there's no real point in praying because he can want to answer your prayers as much as he wants. He can desire to give you something as much as he wants. If he's bound by something outside of himself, his hands are tied, he's not going to be able to do it for you. Praying, uh, praying to a non-sovereign God is ridiculous, especially if the reason God is sovereign or is not sovereign is because he's bound in some way to human will. If God's sovereignty is bound by human will, then instead of praying to God, you might as well just do it yourself or go to somebody else because it is people apparently who restricted God's sovereignty and therefore people have this great power over God. And therefore it's these people who can answer your prayers and not God. And that's really the consequence of God not being sovereign. Is there's just, there's just no point in going to him for prayer. None at all. Um, think of it this way, you really want something and maybe it's God's desire to give it to you. You pray and you ask him and he says, sure, I'll do it. I'll, I'll give it to you. But then it turns out somebody else wants it and they, by their free will, get it instead. Even though God wanted to give you that answer, he wanted to answer that prayer with a yes, he wasn't able to because he's not truly sovereign in this case. And that's, I think, really a more accurate view of the modern kind of evangelical view of God's sovereignty. Whereas in reality, God is sovereign over all things. Now, I still believe in human responsibility. If I do something wrong, it's entirely my own fault. I couldn't dare blame the devil. I don't get to blame the devil. I don't get to blame God. I have to blame myself if I do something wrong. When I do something right, it's for the glory of God. I can't remember who said it, but someone said, all the good in me is from God and the rest is my fault. I believe that was Augustine. And it's true, all the good in me comes from God, and anything that's in me that's not good is entirely my own. And it's really just when you have a view of God's sovereignty that is true and proper, you can finally start to have some amount of contentment as a Christian. Because if you don't have a good and proper view of God's sovereignty, well, you're going to be very confused by a lot of things, and you're not going to be able to trust him. Something bad happens and you, you know, if you don't have a good view of God's sovereignty, you think, why is this happening? What's going on? So on and so forth. But if you have a good view of God's sovereignty and something bad happens, you may still think those things in a moment of weakness. But you're also free to think, OK, God is doing something. He's doing this for a reason. This isn't beyond him. 
Uh, I'll give you an example of that. Uh, recently, I've been having a lot of shifts in my theological understandings of certain things, and I want and I heard an argument from church history that I found to be extremely compelling. Now I wanted to talk to my pastor about this um, this Sunday, and I was really open to look, talk to him about it. And one of the arguments I was going to tell him about, and I wasn't going to try and convince him of my things, I just wanted to, uh, to talk to him about it, one of the arguments I was going to try and bring to him, that was for me really the nail in the coffin, it was the thing that, you know, it made me um, basically change my mind on it, um, I was going to bring that to him, but because I, I wasn't able to go to, uh, to church this week, because of certain reasons, and I was quite upset by this, I even made a post about it, I was very upset by this, and I was thinking, well, I, I want to go, I want to see my pastor and talk about this. But I knew, and I think I even mentioned this in the post, I knew God is sovereign. He's doing this for a reason. Don't know what that reason is, but there you go. And then later on in that same day, um, at a time that would have been either during or after I went to church, so I would have only seen it after I went to church, after I talked to my pastor, someone had DM'd me, seen my argument, DM, or they'd seen the post, DM'd me, messaged me, I'd told them this same argument, and they'd not debunked it, but they'd shown me that it wasn't nearly as strong as I had thought. And so then I realised, oh, if I'd have gone to my pastor with this, it would have, you know, it, it wouldn't have been quite so strong as I would have thought. And I think now knowing that, um, having a better understanding of that argument, when I do bring it to him and talk to him about it, uh, it'll just be a much better conversation. And so I think in his sovereignty, God was deciding that this week I wouldn't be going. I wouldn't be presenting that argument to him so that now I have more time to study these things out, to look into these arguments and to make sure I know what I'm talking about. Um, we'll wait for these leaves to go. So that's just one example of God's sovereignty is, you know, because I couldn't understand why, why can't I go to church this week? What, you know, what's going on? And, but then when I got that message, I had that conversation and I realized that, oh, this isn't the, the, quite the argument I thought it was. I realized that I think that was a kindness from God making it so that I wouldn't have gone forward with that argument. And uh, well, who knows what would have happened then uh, if I had. But that's just one example from very recently of, you know, something happening. And in the moment, I don't understand it. But then something else happens and it becomes clear to me. This was the sovereignty of God in action he did this for a reason and so on um give you another example before i started going to the church i uh, i'm at now i considered going to different churches but i spent two years not going to church for stupid excuses um stupid reasons and so on and so one of the days i was going to start going to a church um Basically, I went to sit into the car, and it was about an hour drive from one place where I was, um, which I don't want to get too specific with my living situation. Basically, at the time, this would have been every Sunday an hour drive. Now, it would be hour and a half drive from where I am now uh, every Sunday, which is just not feasible for my family and so on, right? Well, anyway, I went to sit down into the car and it was someone who was going to, it was in Galway City and it was someone who was bringing me, was going up, up that way anyway, so they, they had to go do something. I went to sit into the car and I wasn't feeling well that day. As soon as I sat down into the car, I just got this kind of odd rush of pain up my back and I had to stand back up again. I couldn't sit down because of that, I couldn't go to that church. And now, and then, because I wasn't going to that church, I had to look for another church. And I ended up finding one that was much closer, between 20 minutes and half an hour away from myself, which is the church I attend now. And so I think God, in his sovereignty, was ensuring I didn't go to that one church which would have been nearly most, uh, pretty much impossible to maintain any sort of regular attendance. So that later on, I would find a church that I could regularly attend. At least that's what I think was happening. So these are just examples of me seeing God's sovereignty in my life. Like I said before, these are not just things where the situation happened to work out for the best. These are not things where it just kind of happened to go that way. Just it went good. 
These are situations where God being fully sovereign and fully in control did exactly what he intended to do. And I'm sure if you look back in your life, you will see, I mean, God is sovereign every second of every day. So every instance for your life that anything happened, it was God's sovereignty at play. But I'm sure there are particular moments you can look back on in your life and you can say, I can see, not at the time I couldn't, but now looking back, I can see the hand of God working clear as day. And I mean, I think that's a wonderful and beautiful thing that we can you know we can look and we can see his uh, hand working we can see what he does in our lives maybe not um as he's doing it but hold on oh i don't know maybe not and uh, hold on Is that this world? I spawned the wolf egg. I can't remember was it this world or not. I think it was. I don't cheat much. Sometimes I do just to see things. Anyway. Uh, I've never given myself anything. Well, I gave myself a wolf spawn egg apparently. But I've never given myself like diamonds or anything. Um, no wolf around here anyway. But I don't know. I need more wheat to feed these guys. But look back at your life and, you know... I think you'll be able to see these moments where at the time you maybe didn't notice the hand of God working, you didn't realize what was going on and so on. But later on, something happened, something came of it that you wouldn't have foreseen. And it's in that, oh, oh meal. And it's in that moment that you realize, oh, that's what God was doing. That's what he was working out in my life. And it, it really is just one of the most beautiful things of being a Christian is, seeing his sovereignty in play it isn't just uh, a concept for theologians to think about it isn't just something that we see over the course of history in general it's not just a general thing that oh yeah generally speaking god's plan will come to pass overall over the course of history this is an actual active thing that we can really see in our lives day to day and um, and i think that's just truly wonderful how much wheat do I have? Yeah, I'll get some more baby cows. Um, but yeah, it, it, it really is one of the most wonderful parts of being a Christian is seeing God work. Um, so you just look at that, look into your own lives and see. How have you seen him work? What has he been? I need a new axe. What has he been doing in your life? What has he been achieving and accomplishing for his glory? And that's what it all comes down to at the end of the day is for his purposes and his glory. And we can't ever forget that. God is not sovereign for us. He does do things for us for no other reason than his kindness. God has sovereignly worked out a plan that allows him to be kind to us because he wishes to be kind to us because he is kind. But he doesn't work out his plan for us. At the end of the day, he works out his plan for his glory and for his exaltation. And that's something as well that I think most modern evangelicals wouldn't like to hear, that it's all for God in pretty much every conceivable way. It's all for his glory, all for his exaltation. He is sovereign to his own glory we do things for his glory as paul said to the corinthians um but we again very self-centered in the modern day we like to think of things being done for us god does things for us we don't do things for him we don't glorify him he gifts us things in his sovereignty um but that's just not true he does gift us things and he is kind to us but he is that way for his glory he is sovereign for his glory and I think that's a, a wonderful thing that he is able to glorify himself in a way that ensures he can still be just so extremely kind to us. And the thing about kindness, of course, is it's undeserved. We don't do anything to God or for God that makes us worthy of his kindness. He is kind to us out of his own nature, out of his own character. He is kind to us because he is kind. Uh, I know. And he is kind to us in his sovereignty, not because he needs to be kind in order for his plan to unfold, 
but because he has decided to plan things in such a way that involves him being kind to us. And that's one of the most wonderful, beautiful parts of the Christian life. So yeah, that was just a little talk on the sovereignty of God. Hope you guys enjoyed this video. Hope the audio was a bit better than it was last time. I'm sorry about that. Um, thank you guys for watching. Goodbye and God bless.